pay attention to whether your forgiveness is actually enhancing this relationship and leading it to a place of growth or whether you just keep pardoning the same sins and errors. What is a narcissist magnet? I'm sure you have a pretty decent sense of what they are. I like to say that your various narcissistic magnetic pieces are the things that get you sucked in and get you stuck in to these relationships. And by that I mean, these are what I consider to be the vulnerability factors a person may have that make them more vulnerable to falling into a narcissistic relationship. Now to be an, ha, have sort of these mag, narcissistic magnet qualities, things that draw narcissists towards you, this can affect the relationships you sort of choose. A partner, a friend, a work situation, these are the people that there's a bit more of a voluntary element because th there's a moment where the narcissist has to come into your life and you kind of have to sign off on it and stick it out. These are elements of yourself that aren't necessarily bad things. They may actually be some of the best parts of yourself. But these elements of you may blind you to narcissism, lead you to make someone who makes a lot of excuses for their bad behavior, makes it hard for you to step away and may leave you more likely to blame yourself in one of these relationships as well. This series is a part of what I do talk about with people who come to my retreats and other seminars because what I found is that many people can really get angry at themselves. How did I get stuck in this mess? Why am I in this relationship? Like, I am a smart person. I have a good job. I've got good friends. I'm well put together. Why am I in this situation where I'm behaving like a fool? And people will get really angry at themselves. But when we work backwards, we start to realize that the reason a narcissistic individual was able to get close enough, insinuate themselves into our lives, and stick around, and we didn't show them the door, is because of these sorts of narcissist magnet qualities we have. Things that made it more likely that we became almost strangely attractive to the narcissist, maybe because it was going to make us a little bit more easy to manipulate, or we have to take ownership. It put us in a situation where we were going to, again, be less likely to see the red flags. Now, I tread very lightly as I go into this series. I want to make one disclaimer right up the front. When I talk about these sorts of magnets, this is by no means meant to blame someone. Well, this is your fault for being forgiving. It's not that at all. These are vulnerabilities. But these vulnerabilities, coupled with a lack of knowledge about narcissism, is why you a wise, well put together person would have ended up in a relationship where you're saying, my judgment's good in all the other areas of my life. These magnet qualities are, again, qualities in yourself that actually play out beautifully in other human relationships, but get taken advantage of in this one. Then when you combine that, being having these sort of narcissist magnet traits with a lack of knowledge about narcissism, that's when you can really find yourself getting into these really tricky spaces. The goal of my YouTube channel has always been to educate people and enlighten them about what these patterns are about. So once they start happening, you don't make excuses, rationalizations, and second chances. You see it clearly, and you make a choice that works for you, or you ratchet your expectations to a realistic space. So by understanding what your vulnerabilities are, these so-called kind of magnetic qualities that you have that might draw you in and keep you in, it's to help you cultivate those if they're the healthy pieces of yourself and also to understand if they're not the healthy parts of yourself, that these are vulnerabilities. And what that means is as you go through life, whether it's picking an employer, choosing friends, or certainly doing something important like choosing a life partner, that you remain mindful, that you do have some of these vulnerabilities. These magnets are just as much magnets, things that draw narcissists to you, as they are blind spots. And if you can be aware of that blind spot, for example, if you have a real propensity to forgive people, 
or you're very much one of those people who loves to rescue people, that you might ha run the risk of giving too much of yourself to a toxic relationship. By viewing it through a lens of exactly what are these qualities in me that might be making me potentially vulnerable to the charms and the manipulations of a narcissist, you can take ownership. It makes you less of a passive player in this and have you wonder like, mm, yeah, I know this about myself and I really need to be eyes wide open. And you're also going to learn some interesting things like, yeah, there's just not just one magnet you might be holding. You might have multiple magnetic types. So pay attention in this series. And as it goes on, take note of which of these may fit you well. And it may be more than one. And as you figure that out, I'm hoping it'll give you more of a roadmap that'll protect you the next time you find yourself with a tyrannical boss or if you're already in a relationship when one more time you're having to face down the gaslighting of your partner or if you're dating to have your eyes wide open to make sure you're not falling into these patterns of excuses and rationalizations or if you're putting up with an egocentric friend's usual manipulations that you can be aware of what things about yourself have rendered you vulnerable and address those. So I do hope you enjoy this series. I hope it, is, it opens your eyes to some of the things that might be risk factors for you. So that way you can really work on your ground game, focus on protecting yourself, but also remember some of these magnetic traits you have, you're going to see they're some of the best parts of yourself. Don't hand them over to the narcissistic lowest bidder. Save them for the people who deserve to see those best parts of yourself. Now, in simple psychological terms, we gravitate to that which is familiar. But it's a bit more complicated than that. Yes, it is familiar, but our family dynamics also shape quite a bit of who we are, including our identities. In a narcissistic family system, the prevailing narratives are that you are not good enough or that you need to earn your love, or that you need to be a source of narcissistic supply to your narcissistic parent or parents to keep their love, or you are judged on the basis of how you look, or what you can do, or how good you can make your parents look. Everything in a narcissistic family is conditional. The other things that get learned in a narcissistic family system are that you learn to push down and deny your own needs. You learn to enable the narcissistic parent. You learn to get accustomed to being gaslighted and manipulated. You may become accustomed to the silent treatment and invalidation may feel normal. What you do not get as much exposure to you to in a narcissistic family, honestly, if you get any exposure to it, is unconditional love, the opportunity to talk about your feelings, or encouragement to explore your interests, or to even just simply be seen or be heard for who you are. So with that backstory from your childhood, as you get propelled into the world of adult relationships, you can see how it becomes a setup for a vulnerability. Yes, we do gravitate to that which is familiar. But sadly, we also become trained. If you're from a narcissistic fam a family, you get trained to endure toxic patterns such as invalidation, gaslighting, or manipulation. Having a narcissistic parent renders you vulnerable at the level of identity, behavior, expectation, and self-esteem. And in this way, you can be very blinded to the red flags that a new partner or boss or roommate or friend may be waving in front of you because, honestly, these red flags are all you've ever known. The dark side to this, especially when it comes to partners, is that when you have a narcissistic parent, you may be more likely to walk away from a healthy partner if you get one. The confusion and triangulation of your childhood mean that you may gravitate to partners only where there is confusion and triangulation, and you may write off healthier partners as boring 
or give the great excuse that I hear from people all the time, there was no connection. Now, in many ways, in this situation, the narcissist is just being the narcissist. Okay, you meet a narcissist, they're just being a narcissist. And you may, without awareness, float into the pattern of enabling. You are so accustomed to enabling, to giving second chances and making excuses and creating rationalizations that doing it in an adult relationship becomes second nature. You did it as a kid, why wouldn't you do it as an adult? So what are you supposed to do if you come from a narcissistic family? Utmost and foremost is to gain knowledge. Learning about these personality patterns, becoming aware of how they work and how they impact other people, it becomes absolutely critical. Because once that light bulb goes off above your head, you're gonna start seeing all of it more clearly. Now, I've worked with countless people who have said to me, you know what's interesting, Doc? I haven't dated or married just one narcissist. This has happened over and over again. My guess is that part of this cycle for people who keep doing this is that they just didn't understand what these patterns were. Honestly, for all of you, once you really know it and get it, the cycle may still happen because of trauma bonding and things like that, but it's definitely less likely to. Narcissistic family systems also render you more vulnerable to patterns such as trauma bonding and even codependency. As a child, you associated these chaotic, emotionally abusive, and manipulative patterns with love. And then in adulthood, the same thing. And you make excuses for the narcissistic behavior again. Codependency or any pattern associated with always trying to make it right can be a dynamic that is quite often observed in narcissistic families and can also be reproduced in adult relationships. Knowledge may be a key pathway to undoing these intergenerational cycles, but so too is doing the deeper work of therapy. And this may be trauma-oriented work, or it may also just be the deep dive into your schemas and expectations and your sense of self so you can learn about how your early relationships affect you now and you can start putting an end to some of that narcissistic magnetism you've got. Now this can be a difficult cycle to end because there's something so familiar about narcissists that for a lifetime you might feel an almost inexplicable draw to them and not just in your relationships but also in your friendships and in your workplaces. And even as other people will say to you, why do you let that person treat you that way? You may still take a little bit longer to see it than everyone else is. Again, this is why awareness of these kinds of personality patterns and you doing your own work on you becomes so important. Now what's fascinating to me is when I have worked with people who have been in long-term narcissistic marriages or relationships, for example, for about 20 years or longer, and as we do the work of understanding their relationship, we then start talking about their history. In most cases, the narcissistic patterns manifested by their family of origin was as obvious as the nose on my face. But for them, our work is the very first time that they are seeing it. The blindness they would have to the narcissism of their early life blinded them entirely and rendered them vulnerable to the narcissism that they would endure throughout their adult lives, quite frankly. And then the floodgates open and they recognize it in selected friendships or even past workplace situations. Seeing the childhood pattern clearly is critical to avoid being a magnet for relationships that feel comfortable despite not being good for you. I have to say that as a therapist, what has always been very striking to me is the number of times I'll have a client come in and they'll say, you know, I just had a, I had a good childhood. Like, yeah, they, they're a person who keeps getting into narcissistic relationships. And I, I had a really good, yeah, really good childhood. Like, my parents were good. They worked really hard. They, 
had a great work ethic. They kept a roof over our head. Okay. And they will then start telling me things that will show the cracks around the edges. In very short order, I will see that this family of origin where they're like, they'll often focus on a single virtue their parents had. Like, my parent worked really hard. Or despite everything, there was always like a new toy at Christmas. Like they'd sort of give me the story like the parent did the best they could. But when the parent wasn't doing that one good thing, there was a lot of bad stuff. And you start to realize that many people from narcissistic families have so created an alternative narrative about how happy their family is, that once we do start to puncture it in therapy, it's the first time they have that wake-up call of, wow, yeah, no, not healthy. And as that happens, they start realizing that as adults, they've been enabling their narcissistic parents over and over and over again. And that building that enabling muscle in a way is why they keep getting into narcissistic relationships because they're just so good at enabling. In that case, the enabling needs to, the, or the disenabling, the, enable needs, the enabling needs to stop with your parents. You need to stop doing that. And once you stop doing that, you may actually be in a better position to detect the narcissistic relationships around you. About how overly empathic people can really be narcissist magnets. Now, the term empath is one that has been floating around for a while. And in general, the term signifies a person who is extremely attuned and extremely empathic. And there are wonderful things about this, a deep attempt to be present with other people. They're very connected into their own emotional states. They're able to be responsive to other people and to their emotional states. But there is also a dark side to this of an empath getting lost in their vortex of another person's emotional world, almost giving themselves up to be there for other people, experiencing psychological distress themselves because they feel so much of other people's pain, and struggling to set boundaries with other people because of their deep empathy and their unwillingness to walk away or stay away. Now, I find it difficult to say that anyone out there is overly empathic because I think empathy is a wonderful quality. It's absolutely essential for healthy human relationships. But when that abundance of empathy translates into giving more for others to the neglect of your own self or over giving to other people who just take, take, take and do not reciprocate, the abundance of empathy can be risky for the extremely empathic person. As I've often talked about on this channel, empathy is good. Like I said, it is the stuff of the healthy relationships. Empathy in and of itself is the ability to not only be aware of others, but also to be self-aware. So, why are overly empathic people magnets for narcissists? Because, simply put, the empathic person cares. And the overly empathic person not only cares, but keeps giving and giving and giving because it is simply what they do. And the narcissist keeps taking and taking and taking because it is, because it is simply what they do. The short answer is the overly empathic person lets the narcissist get away with their BS and never calls them on it and just keeps being very sweet to them. It is actually the ultimate setup for a narcissistic person. And because a hyper or very empathic person is not cynical enough to look for red flags, they tend to miss most of them and they try to keep seeing that narcissistic person in their behavior through a lens of compassion. Now, people who are overly empathic often believe that giving and feeling and being present with another person is what human relationships are supposed to be about. And in most cases, except with narcissists, they're absolutely correct. 
And in many human relationships, this abundance of empathy may actually have done quite well by them. But sadly, we live in a world in which people often take advantage of overly empathic people, even people who are not narcissists. I mean, listen, I, you know how I feel about this. And I think that in a world that is becoming increasingly uncivil and polarized and competitive and entitled, it is very easy to devalue empathy and in turn to devalue empathic people. Overly empathic people are at the greatest risk of giving those narcissists second chances, third chances, fourth chances, hundredth chances. They often forgive. They try to see the narcissist's point of view. They rationalize. They keep focusing on compassion. For example, they will make excuses on the basis of a difficult backstory the narcissist may, narcissist may have had in their life and try to use their hypercharged empathy to heal the narcissist and make it all better. A very empathic person hates the idea that someone can't benefit from love and compassion and they definitely don't like the idea of just letting someone go. It doesn't compute for them. They say, that's not right. I am going to be compassionate. It's who I am. Now, once a narcissist starts to see that they can do what they want and the very empathic person that's with them is, keeps letting them get away with it, the narcissist becomes a spoiled toddler who will start testing every limit. This is not to say that the empathic person in the relationship will not be hurt or even angry or frustrated. They will. But they'll just continue to keep issuing second chances again and again and again because everybody in their book deserves a chance and everybody deserves to be loved. Remember, the red flags in narcissistic relationships show up very early. And an overly empathic person will often not see them because they will simply, they'll simply be focusing on being emotionally available all of the time. And that can translate into just making excuses for the narcissist. Now, I've had the pleasure of working with very empathic clients throughout the course of my clinical career. And I've seen many of them get very lost in narcissistic relationships. They'll often come in to me, working to work with me, looking like the walking wounded. They'll simply literally almost not understand what's happening and that no matter what they did, their partner wouldn't change their behavior. Because now you know, narcissistic people don't really change their behavior. And actually, where the hyper-empathic people really start noticing the cracks in their relationships is after they have children. The empathic folks out there may just keep ex making excuses from their own perspective, right? I'm the empathic person. I believe in compassion. I'm going to keep making excuses. But because the hyper-empathic person is also very empathic towards their own children, that's when they may become distressed to see how the narcissistic partner's behavior is negatively impacting their child and actually may become confused because at some point you do start getting tapped out on the whole empathy thing if there's none coming in and someone vulnerable that you also deeply empathize for is getting hurt. Not only are overly empathic people very much narcissist magnets, but it is very difficult for them to get out of these relationships. They are often plagued by guilt, especially if their narcissist often hoovers them back in. They may also feel guilty for not trying hard enough, loving the person enough, listening enough it can actually start taking on, I mean, I hate to say it, but almost a more codependent feel over time with the hyper empathic individual running a risk of giving to this narcissistic person to the point of exhaustion and definitely far beyond the point of healthy. It is almost as though there is some sort of value to the empathic person in enduring all of this bad treatment. 
But we have to be careful, as that may not always be the case. As I've been saying for a very long time, one of the main reasons people get into and stay in these relationships is lack of knowledge. And people who are very empathic are at the same vulnerability of not having the knowledge as everybody else. And, as I've also observed, are often quite resistant to that knowledge. I have had more than a few experiences when very empathic people have told me, I'm actually very mean-spirited. Me, Romani, is very mean-spirited to even talk about narcissism and that I shouldn't be labeling people and that everyone deserves to be loved and felt and given a chance. And I'll listen to them because I do agree that everyone absolutely deserves love. I also believe that nobody should ever have to endure any form of abuse or invalidation in the name of making a relationship work. It can take a while, but over time, once the patterns are laid bare for people who are very empathic, there can be a slow transformation and painful acceptance of the narcissistic relationship that they are in. But even with that knowledge and acceptance, some very empathic people stay in the narcissistic relationship. That is how vulnerable that hyper-empathic people can be to and be in their narcissistic relationships. So, very empathic people exhaust themselves. Like, like, I don't know, like moths who are drawn to a flame who get burned. They believe, they truly believe in the power of empathy. But they often have trouble cutting their losses and leaving something that is a one-way street. Some very empathic people will spend lifetimes in these relationships, basically serving as an emotional punching bag for a narcissist. And it can be painful to watch all that they endure because they have such faith in compassion and empathy and change. Now, some slowly come out of the darkness and heartbreakingly they do recognize that it is time to, that it is time to go and leave one of these relationships. Now, while the Magnet series does largely apply to relationships you choose, like partners or friends or colleagues or bosses, you can see how the hypercharged empathy can also get you stuck in a family relationship with a toxic parent or sibling or toxic adult child. And one major vulnerability is that those who are very empathic have likely been like this their entire lives until they were very, since they were very small children. So what that means is that in childhood, especially if they were from more narcissistic or antagonistic family systems, they may have been gaslighted or tormented and called too sensitive or mocked for their sensitivity or empathy or scapegoated as, as a byproduct of being so sensitive. That can also result in a vulnerability to the manipulations of a narcissist as an adult. Empathy is wonderful. I love it. But it's also meant to be reciprocal. At some point, it is very important for very empathic people to recognize that it is absolutely wonderful to regard the emotionally impoverished world of the narcissist with compassion and even sadness. But you must also recognize that you can set boundaries and not have to take responsibility for saving the narcissist and step gracefully back from this relationship. More than any other narcissist magnet, this group needs to be reminded that self-preservation is a right. And then take that beautiful empathy to people who give it back and find that when the well is replenished, empathy can be a wonderful thing, especially when it is balanced against the need to also be your own advocate. Ultimately, having empathy for yourself is the most important empathy of all. So to all of you overly super, I don't want to say overly, all of you hyper super 
very empathic people out there. You're group one of these narcissistic magnets. And it is unfortunate because this is an absolutely beautiful quality you have, but it is that very beautiful quality that once a person who is toxic and takes advantage of other people recognizes that you have this, that they may view that they have found this place where they can carry on their merry little entitled way and get away with it. You have the right to set boundaries and it is possible to step away from a toxic relationship in a compassionate way. Thanks again for tuning in. Please, as always, hit that bell, hit that, hit that subscribe button, and I hope this has given you some clarification on how you wonderful, empathic folks can be magnets. So let's talk about you hyper-forgivers, you uber-forgivers, those out there who are just willing to let it go. You know who you are. You're just the people who are willing to keep forgiving, turn the other cheek over and over and over again. So let's start simple. Let's start with what forgiveness means. Merriam-Webster defines it as to cease to feel resentment against an offender, which means after you forgive them, in theory, you no longer resent them for what they did. Now, those of you who are forgivers, you forgive. You are the kings and the queens of second chances. And the reasons you forgive are very wide ranging. Your reasons may be because you believe it's the right thing to do, because it's maybe part of your religious teachings. It could be because you hope that once you forgive the person that they will change, because you might believe that everyone deserves a second chance, because you believe that whatever it was, it was all a big misunderstanding, because you're afraid what will happen if you don't forgive them. Now, forgiveness in and of itself is not a bad thing. Wise, wise people have written about the virtues and the health value of forgiveness for a very long time. And as I have talked about it in other videos and written about in my books, forgiveness, despite all its benefits, just doesn't work with narcissists. So, then why are these hyper-forgivers amongst us such narcissist magnets? Well, first of all, because they keep letting the narcissist get away with everything. And that may be that the narcissist is lying or cheating or doesn't have empathy or just may be plain, plain being mean. The forgivers forgive, they turn the other proverbial cheek, and then it happens again. For a narcissist, it's got to be like living in a monopoly game with endless get-out-of-jail-free cards. Once there is a sense that you will be their enabler through your forgiveness, they're going to stick around because you aren't holding them to a standard. Now, as a forgiver, it's not that you stepped into this situation planning to be an enabler. Instead, it is more likely that you brought your spirit of forgiveness to this relationship as you have to many other relationships. But you may not, again, this is the knowledge piece, you may not have fully understood the difference between narcissistic individuals and healthy people. Listen, nobody, not me, not you, not anybody, behaves well all of the time. We all make mistakes. And if we are fortunate, the people who we may have hurt by our mistakes forgive us and then we receive that as the gift that it is and we do not make that mistake again. The forgiveness to me is a gift but it's also a call to action that we be mindful and never again engage in that hurtful behavior and we take responsibility. And if it turns out that the thing we do cannot be changed, for example, maybe we have a job that requires us to work late all the time, which may mean we are, I don't know, unable to ever be home for dinner. Forgiveness isn't going to change that circumstance. And then it may mean that we have to take a long, hard look and see if that relationship is going to work. It's pretty simple. You do wrong, you take accountability, you hope for forgiveness, and if you get it, you receive it as a gift. But the forgiving person forgives everyone. When it works well, they just keep doing it. But with the narcissist, they keep forgiving again, and the narcissist 
keeps doing unkind or unaware or just downright mean things and the forgiveness doesn't help. Forgivers often learned this process early in life or as part of the society that they are in. Now sadly, forgivers themselves may actually come from narcissistic family systems in which forgiveness was a way to keep giving a narcissistic parent or other family member a free pass and then it becomes a habit and then the forgiver might find themselves just taking that into adulthood. And it's such a shame because forgiveness is such a divine state and when a forgiver keeps experiencing invalidation and the cycle of abuse with a narcissist, it can be demoralizing and test the forgiver's faith in people and in the world at large. Once a narcissist recognizes that you are going to forgive and forgive and forgive, they are often likely to stick around and your forgiveness can keep you stuck because you keep enabling them through the forgiveness and they really do believe that they do not need to be held accountable for their behavior and in some ways your forgiveness can reinforce that point for them so inadvertently you may actually be kind of creating a mini monster that now is being more narcissistic with everyone. Now if you as a forgiver even take the brave step of finally deciding to not forgive them then they may use this as a stepping off point for gaslighting and manipulation. Oh, I can't believe you won't forgive me. We're all human. Oh, you're the one who's always believed in second chances. Well then by then you might feel very stuck because that might really hurt for you to hear that. Now Desmond Tutu writes that forgiving is not forgetting. It is actually remembering. Remembering and not using your right to hit back. It's a second chance for a new beginning and the remembering part is particularly important especially if you don't want to repeat what happened. But here's the thing, taking Tutu's quote here, the responsibility is on you to remember and remember that the narcissist is not changing their behavior or is future faking you and telling you that someday they will change their behavior. So you take them back and then someday they'll change it and you know the drill and you know how that's going to go down. Be selective with your forgiveness. It is actually an amazing ability to be able to forgive. Just be judicious and don't hand it out so easily. Pay attention to whether your forgiveness is actually enhancing this relationship and leading it to a place of growth or whether you just keep pardoning the same sins and errors. Save the forgiveness for those who are worthy and if you do give it to a narcissist, recognize that you are on a carousel that's going to keep going around and around and around. Narcissistic individuals love people who let them do what they want to do with no consequence. They are the proverbial spoiled child. Forgiveness in their hands is the ultimate enabling and they feel entitled to it. So you forgivers pay attention to this aspect of yourself and recognize that this special part of you may actually be something that makes you very vulnerable to the machinations of a narcissist. So it's hard to think about it that way that something that is so lovely, so divine, something that people are taught in their religious communities and were taught rolling, while they were growing up that forgiveness is everything that there is a real vulnerability that you hold those teachings and are going to keep making excuses for the narcissist. Also keep in mind for those of you who are forgivers how much forgiveness may have been used as a manipulation in a family system. The narcissistic people in the family are the ones who might talk the most about forgiveness. People feel very guilty if they don't forgive. They keep forgiving those individuals. Those people keep doing bad things you keep doing it and then when the day finally comes that you decide in that family you don't want to be the forgiver anymore 
those imperious family members, holier-than-thou, self-righteous, narcissistic family members, will turn to you and say, Oh, how could you? This is a family that forgives. And the manipulation comes up again. This is a cycle you can get stuck into from childhood to adulthood. But that, that pattern of forgiveness, keep, remember, when a narcissist receives forgiveness, it's their get-out-of-jail-free card. They are not going to change their behavior and now feel that this is great. I'm going to get forgiven and I can keep doing what I want and not be held accountable. So please be careful, forgivers. You're a very classical magnet that can get pulled into these relationships and get stuck in for a very long time because of guilt and manipulation. I hope that clears up the role of the forgivers or hyper forgivers as they are in the, in the world of the narcissistic magnet universe. Thank you again for tuning in. Please hit that subscribe button. Please hit that bell to get notifications. And as always, thank you for tuning in.